lives of people, we can solve their problems. But then here's a second dynamic that is coming into the cities that are contributing to the, to the change of demographics and the diversity of the cities. Climate change. Climate change is real. And we know that unless we solve that problem, if you step back and look globally, the potential for changing the power relationships between and among nation states, the capacity to, to, to destroy human life on this planet is beyond our comprehension. But if we stop and dwell upon it and think about it for a minute, the implications are profound. So then we say, okay, that's a huge thing. So we're going to wrestle the problem of the challenges of climate change to the cities. Ah, so we start making the cities more efficient. I'm old enough to remember when there was a mass exodus out of the cities. Let's get the hell out of these cities and leave it to these people. I'm going into the suburbs, schools are cool, fresh air, blah, blah, blah. But then suddenly, it's politically correct. It makes sense. It contributes to a healthy environment by reducing your carbon footprint. So people started to march back into the cities. Not only is it intellectually sound, is it politically sound, environmentally sound, it's also very hip, right, to live in the cities. So here comes a major influx of people into the cities for the right reasons. I'm not challenging that at all. But what are the byproduct, what is the byproduct of that? Somebody moves in, somebody gets to <coughs> out. So people moving in to reduce their carbon footprint, now people least able to handle the shock of increased carbon footprint are the people pushed out. Now the workers, the low income people, people who are on minimal you know, level, are now, if they're lucky to have a job in the city, they're 100 miles away. 150 miles away, because the further down the road, you can rent, you can own, you can be there, because you can't afford to live here. Data indicated that in these urban environments, the cost of living, the cost of rent, the cost of real estate is extraordinary. So here are these folks, least able to handle it. So my point is this. The challenge of green in our cities and reducing our carbon footprint is important because we have to get our hands around the issue of climate change. It affects the entire human family and we've got to get at it. That's not an academic question, that's real. We've got to have the political tenacity and the will to challenge that. In the meantime, here are all these ramifications. So if we are environmentalists in the true sense of the word, if we are ecologists in the true sense of the word, word, then how do we embrace the ecology of the human beings who are in the cities that we're now dislocating? What's our obligation to them? How do we allow people to enjoy the reality of living in the cities and continue to participate? Or do we simply say, I got there first, and I'm here to say, no, that's not what we're about. And I come from a community, this community, that 50 years ago saw its responsibility to each other. Now we have to be responsible to each other. Okay? So what am I saying to you young people? One of the frequently asked questions of me with young people is, Mr. Dellums, what's different, the difference between your generation when you are our age and us? Good question, right? Here's my answer. When we were your age, time wasn't a factor. We never dwelled on time. Martin Luther King said, go out and change the world. We went out there raising hell to change the world. We never thought about time. 
But your generation must now deal with time because the world is changing at lightning speed. Climate change, lightning speed. Cyberspace, lightning speed. Cybersecurity, lightning speed. Technological advancement, scientific discoveries, lightning speed. Infectious disease can move around the world like this. You realize how small the place really is. So the first difference is one of urgency. We didn't feel urgency. You must now feel urgency. Secondly, we used to have a saying back in the 60s, I never met a bigger than a foxhole. You know what a foxhole is, you know what you should be war. It's a concept very simple. When you're confronted with a common threat, People tend to unite. They don't have differences. I got your back, you got mine. Okay? We're together. And that, that, that becomes like really cool when you watch uh, alien, space alien movies. <laughs> you, don't, you don't hear people going, you white guy, you black guy, you Latin guy. Earthmen versus aliens. <laughs> so they all unite because there's a common threat. So what am I saying to you? The foxhole is now changed, and the foxhole is the entire planet, and you're all in it. All of us. Climate change doesn't care what color you are, what your economic background is. It's equal opportunity, destroy your... Okay, so, our challenge in our generation was fighting off the sectarian battles of race and gender and sexual orientation, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Your generation challenges, how do we get our arms around the entire human family and do it fast enough to be able to address the myriad problems that endanger the human family? I'm not saying that sectarian battles don't continue to exist. We see that every day. What I am saying, however, is we've got to be strong enough and smart enough to say to the bigot, hey man, in case you haven't figured it out, at the end of the day, this stuff bearing down on both of us, and the extent you want to stand there like a damn fool and keep playing bigot games is the extent to which we don't come together to build a coalition that's in our mutual and enlightened self-interest, your choice. That's very empowering to say to people, okay? Get over it, man. <coughs> and we're still playing these little, when all, all these big things are coming at us at lightning speed. The other difference, Martin Luther King told us, go out and change the world. Advocate peace, freedom, justice, and equality, because it's the right thing, the ethical thing, the moral thing, the principal thing to do. I'm saying to you, the difference is you got to go out and do those same things because it's the only damn thing to do. Yesterday's principle is today's imperative. You have no choice. Peace you have to secure because war is too dangerous and, and too, too extraordinary. Challenges all life. You can't afford the luxury of ignoring problems. Look at the explosions in the urban environments in this country, all over. At some point, those explosions blow up in everybody's face, so they can't be ignored. So now, freedom and peace and justice and equality, those things have to be achieved because the very <coughs> survival is at stake. It is now the great imperative. So, the last one. Martin Luther King told us, I may not get there with you, but you will get to the promised land. So we went out there fighting. Martin Luther King said, we're going to win this battle. So we went out. He never told us we couldn't change the world. Never told us we couldn't change the world. So we moved out of our optimism, out of our idealism, out of our hope. Even when we were frightened, we overcame our fear because we had hope and optimism. Your generation is being told 24 hours a day, system's broken, can't fix it, 
whole bunch of clowns. There's nothing to it. It's a great conspiracy theory. It's a rigged system. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you something. 